Amen. Please be seated. Well, this morning, we are starting a new series in the book of Jonah. How about that? Has anybody here ever heard the story of the book of Jonah? I see one hand. What kind of a church is this? There's a few more now. Okay, well, I imagine the book, of the, the story, maybe not the details, but at least the general story is familiar to most of you. Uh, and, and the reason I bring that up at the outset is that that actually makes it kind of a challenge for me to preach. In, in one sense, it should be easy because I don't have to tell you a whole, you know, what you already know. In another sense, familiarity often leads us to a place where we miss the things that we aren't looking for, the things we're not expecting to find. Uh, so it'll be interesting. I, I picked this because I expected it to be a nice short series, and I, I think it probably can still be that. But the more I spend time in the book of Jonah, the richer I find it, and the more I, I am tempted to, to do something like we did with Philemon and, and go slower and kind of deeper, and that seems like it fits with the theme, right, of ocean and depth. And Anyway, this morning, we're going to look at chapter one as a whole, and uh, we could maybe come back to it at some point, but for now, we're just going to... We're going to do a broad sketch, and I take, I'm, I'm going to look particularly at something that Jonah brings up in the passage, um, and that's who, who God is and what that means for Jonah and for others in the story, particularly in this chapter. Um, I feel like there's probably more introduction that could be done, should be done, but I'm just going to read and then pray, and then we'll, we'll just go from there.
O Lord, God of heaven, maker of the sea and the dry land, we thank you for this word that we have before us this morning. Lord, I pray that as we look deeper, as we study it, as we learn from it, that we would see you even more clearly than before. That you would open our eyes and our hearts to the depths of who you are and what that means for us. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to each of us this morning and that we would respond appropriately to who you are. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned the title comes right from the passage. Uh, it's from Jonah's declaration of who it is that he worships. The Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And as we look at who that God is this morning, we're going to be looking at three, imagine that, three things that we see in this passage about who God is. The first is that his reign is inescapable. You can't get away from it. How could you if he created the sea and the dry land? And yet that's exactly what it seems Jonah's trying to do, is escape from God's reign over his life. There's a lot that we do, that we say, that we think about Jonah, that comes from the book of Jonah, and then there's a lot that comes just from our own biases and uh, other, other things. Over the centuries, even before Christ came, we have written different interpretations of the book of Jonah, how Jewish rabbis interpreted it, how early Christians interpreted it, how modern Christians interpret it. Lots and lots and lots of interpretations. Some are more sympathetic to Jonah than others. Some are very hard on Jonah. Some of us are very hard on Jonah, and some of us are very sympathetic to Jonah. I'm not sure where the right place to land is on that, but I think that there's probably some of both in there. I think the reason that we have both in both Jewish and Christian interpretive history is because... There's, there's a little bit of Jonah in each of us. We all have situations where we would prefer not to do what we know God wants us to do. And we all react differently to that. Some of us really beat ourselves up over that. And some of us don't at all. Um... And I think that colors a lot of how we see Jonah as we read this story. My, my focus this morning is going to be less, though, on Jonah. We're going to get to Jonah's motivations later in the this, in this series, because he gives them to us plainly later in the book. But because they're not spelled out at this point in the story, we're just going to put that off for now. We'll come back to it later. What we do see clearly here is not so much Jonah's feelings and motivations as God's activity and his revelation, both to Jonah and to the sailors. How does God reveal himself to Jonah? Well, he, he speaks to him. The, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, saying this very explicit thing. Go to the city of Nineveh preach against it, and then a reason, because its wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh was not a place that most people would consider at that time part of the Lord's domain. His people were the Israelites. Jonah was an Israelite. Nineveh belonged to a different group of people who did not follow the Lord. The ancient Near Eastern perspective on 
deities, gods, goddesses, spiritual beings, was very focused on limitations. They had power and had reasons to, to fear them, but was very focused on this god is over this thing over here, and this one's over that thing over there, and this one's over here, and that one's over there. And what set Israel's God apart was the belief that he truly did rule over everything. Everything, everything, everywhere, and everyone. And so while Jonah is torn in how to respond, there's this opening to this book that that is declaring to the reader that this God extends his reign beyond just the people who he called out to be special, Israel. His, his reign extends even to Nineveh, even to these people who had absolutely no interest in him and had not done anything to obey him. That his reign included punishment for things that had been done, that were continuing to be done, by people who did not follow him. That's not something, that, that's not unique to the ancient world that people would have trouble with that concept. That concept continues to be a stumbling block for people today. If if we talk about God punishing people who don't follow him, in today's context, people are going to get offended. They're going to get upset. How dare this person, this deity, this however they want to receive God's character, God's being, however they want to talk about him, they often will say, how dare he presume to have authority over people who don't give him that authority. There's this attitude that the authority is actually in the individual person to determine whether or not anyone, God or anyone else, should have that authority over them. But as the maker of heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land, he rules over all of it, including each of the people that inhabit it. And throughout this story, we're going to come to this idea that not only does he rule over the people, he rules over the animals too. And that the animals obey God even more than the people do. It's fascinating. His reign is inescapable. You cannot get away from it. Jonah tries... And it does not work out well for Jonah. The sailors try when they hear what's going on. They go, okay, well, we need to at least get off of the sea. If this is the, this is, this God rules over the sea and Jonah has upset this God, we need to get Jonah away from the sea. We need to at least get out of this dangerous situation. So they're rowing and rowing, throwing cargo overboard, doing everything they can to, to escape this domain that he rules over, to escape the punishment that he's trying to inflict upon Jonah. But they can't get away. The, the, this God is too powerful, and his control over the sea is too powerful for them to be able to escape it. That's, that's the main focus, I think, of, of portraying this story the way that it is. There's so much that we can say about the, the structure, the beauty. I mean, this is an incredible, not just this chapter, this whole book. It's just an incredibly well put together account of this whole saga with Jonah. And I, I keep, I, I'm hesitating because I keep wanting to say story, but I know that that's going to throw some people off because I'm not saying it didn't happen. It very much did happen. 
But as with all historical accounts, how you tell the story of what really happened is somewhat at the discretion of the person who relays the story. If you know, this morning we were in Sunday school, we were telling the stories of our lives, really, how we met our spouses, how we came to know God. And each of us told our stories in very different ways, and we have different stories. But we also had opportunity to frame our stories as we thought was best for that setting, for that audience, for what we were trying to communicate. And so, and because we didn't have all morning, we didn't share every detail of every piece of every story. We picked and chose the pieces that fit together to communicate the parts that made sense to communicate. And that doesn't mean we were lying. We, I, I certainly hope nobody was lying. I don't have any reason to suspect anybody was. But how you tell a story, even a true story, is, is really at the discretion of the person relaying it. And that's so true for this story as well, that, that there's so many things that are just... People who, who love literature love this story because they see in it so many great tools of literary design put together. A great story might use two or three, and, and this one uses, I don't know how many, way more than two or three. It's so many, so many literary techniques to, to really help the reader enter into the story. To, to feel like you're on the sea, in the boat, with the sailors. That there's this sense of urgency that's communicated. There's this sense of chaos and calm. There's, there's so many contrasts throughout, actually. Um, and through all of it, God is portrayed as the one over all of it. So, so you have, they, they set out, clearly there wasn't a storm when they started. I guess it doesn't say that explicitly. But it says, he went aboard, sailed, to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose. That, that concept, that the violent storm arose, suggests very strongly that there wasn't a storm before that. Things were calm. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam, they're in trouble. And then, near the end, it reverses. They go from, it's so intense that they can't row to shore to calm when they throw Jonah overboard. Jonah is described as being in this deep sleep in the boat. And it's a, it's a phrase that we really have a hard time translating because I think it's trying to translate a concept that even, even Jew, early Hebrew thought didn't have. But it's, it's what's used to describe Adam when God put him into a deep sleep and then took out a rib to make Eve performed surgery on him, essentially. He was out. He was, yeah, he was anesthetized. I can't even say that word, but he, <laughs> he, he was out, out, right? There's this sense that Jonah is in so much distress over what God has called him to do and trying to flee from God's presence that it it causes his whole body to just shut down. Everything else, though, continues as you almost would expect, that, that everybody else responds appropriately to the situation and to God. Jonah continues to just resist. Um, the sailors when they hear Jonah's description of the Lord, they respond the right way. They say, well, what, do we, what should we do? They don't, they don't question this God's authority. They don't question 
whether or not this could possibly be. These are, these are not modernist atheists. These are polytheists who are being told about yet another god for them to add to the list of, peop- of beings they should be concerned about. They, they hear about this god and they say, well then, first of all, what, what were you thinking? If this is who this God is, why on earth, why would you think this was a good idea? You've put us all in danger. We're all going to die because you got on this boat. Why did you do that? And then they ask, what do they need to do? There's this expectation they have that, that Jonah knows not only how he offended God, but also what needs to be done to make that offense right. And Jonah has a pretty good, he kind of has a good idea. And this is one of those things that comes up in interpretation. And there are a few different ways to go. One is Jonah is being selfless. He's saving the sailors by offering up his life. Throw me in and you'll all be okay. I'm the one who needs to be punished. I'll die and you'll be fine. And he's submitting to God's authority. Another interpretive option is that Jonah is so focused on running from God that he sees that as the the next out. Well, I couldn't get away via the boat. Maybe I'll get away via death. That there's a stubborn um, obstinance in Jonah's response. There's a few different ways you can go with it. Jonah does not escape from God's rule by getting thrown overboard. Whether that was his intent or not, he doesn't. He still finds himself in the hands of this God who rules over the sea and all the things that live in it, including this really big fish. That Jonah can't escape from God's rule no matter what he does, no matter how he tries. One of the things that I think is just fantastic um, is, is what the sailors say in verse 14. As they're throwing Jonah overboard, they're pleading with God not to hold it against them. He, they're saying, we're trying to make this right. Your, your representative here is telling us this is what will make it right. Please don't hold this, this against us. We're just trying to do what needs to be done to survive. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. And then it says, why? For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And what I find so fantastic about that is not just this idea of them trying to wash their hands of the situation. There's certainly that aspect. But one of the things that we often miss in our understanding of the name of the Lord is what it means. When when God revealed his name to Moses, he said, I am who I am, I will be who I will be. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. That 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 name literally means he is who he is. He will be who he will be. That Jonah says to the sailors, I serve the one who will be who he will be, will do what he will do. And they say, you, the one who is and will do what you have done as you please. That that's their whole understanding of God's character. Is that he will do what he will do. And that there's no one and nothing capable of changing that. They recognize. They may not know very much. It's not like Jonah gives them a whole... Here's the Torah, by the way, on my way overboard. They just know this little bit. And they respond appropriately. They greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They were amazed at who this God is. The little bit that they knew. So his reign is inescapable. 
I'm going to keep going. There's probably something I missed. There's, that'll be the whole series. I'm just overwhelmed with all the, all the things. Jonah responds to God's revelation with rejection. He rejects God's revelation. The sailors respond with reverence. They, they respond appropriately. But the next thing we want to look at is that his grace knows no bounds. His reign's inescapable. So Jonah's not going to get out of what God's calling him to do. He's not going to be able to escape from God's oversight of his life. And the same is true for the sailors. They're not going to be able to get away from this situation just by rowing their way out of it. But God's grace also extends to those places those situations. The sailors are not people who already know and follow the Lord, and yet they are saved by acting appropriately in the situation, by doing what needed to be done to, sh to show reverence for the Lord, to obey his representative, that they are shown grace in a situation where no one would expect them to find the Lord. How many sailors do you know who suddenly become aware of their immorality and their need to follow God in the middle of the ocean? And yet, there he is, showing his grace even to them. There's a lot of interpretations even of what it means that they feared him and offered a sacrifice and made vows to him. I, I was reading one this week that suggested that, um, the, that they became converts, that the language points to uh, temple worship, that they, they, their vows were vows to follow him and him alone. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure it's that clear, but I think that we often gloss over this portion of the story because we're so focused on Jonah as the main character that we miss out on God's work in the lives of others around him. Jonah could have, God could have just let Jonah run. All right, well, I'll find another prophet to go to Nineveh. But God pursues Jonah, not just in a disciplinary sense, but in a, in a gracious sense. He, he seeks to bring Jonah back relationally. And we'll see that through the story as we continue in weeks to come, that God continues relentlessly to pursue this prophet who has no interest in continuing to follow him. God won't let him go. How gracious is that? How many times have you wandered from the truth? We just did a whole series and a half on that concept. We're so prone to wander. And God continues to relentlessly pursue us and bring us back to graciously <laughs> keep us from running all the way away. His grace knows no bounds. He, he even, as Jonah tries to plunge into the depths of death itself, sends a great fish to rescue him, to keep him alive, sort of. We'll talk about that imagery next week more. Uh, there's certainly a lot of, even in Jonah's psalm, focus on the grave and death. And so there's a question there in, in was he alive alive? Was he dead and resurrected? And we'll, we'll get into all that. But but he, whether he dies and is raised to life again or stays alive and given another chance, the point there is that God doesn't let him 
just die. God gives Jonah another chance. God provides the fish in order to bring Jonah back. Not just to the task that he has for him, but to that that relationship. He's going to continue to challenge Jonah's ideas of what it means to follow him, what it means for him to be both just and merciful. These are things that Jonah will, through our study, declare about God. He knows these things. He he shows in this little book so much knowledge of God's word. And, and yet so little personal understanding. There, there's that distance still. He, he might know it, but he doesn't really know it. And so God uses this whole journey to deepen Jonah's understanding of who he really is. And that's wonderful. There's, um, so, I, I'm, I'm tempted, I'm not like, well, no, no, we'll save a lot of this for later. There's so many connections in this book, though, between the whole of Scripture. There's stuff to Genesis, so there's the creation imagery, there's the God's control over the chaos of the, especially of the waters. Uh, there's, there's connections to, to Jonah as a prophet, and other prophets, particularly, especially, Elijah. There's, there's, there's forward-looking things, too, and we see those unfolded in how New Testament authors, and, and Jesus himself, even, makes connections between Jonah and Christ. The, the whole story is just so saturated with the overarching story of the whole Bible. It's amazing. Uh, but what I want to look at particularly related to that is, is really what our third point is, and that's that his humor echoes through the ages. Um, this is, there's, there's so many things in this story that if you step back just long enough to, to not think of it as improper to laugh at it there's a lot of humor in this story and not just this chapter all the way through there are so many things that if you think about it for just a a little bit of time you go boy that just that's like the opposite of how it should be jonah is almost like the the opposite of a prophet he, instead of going and delivering the word of the Lord, he runs away from it. When he's given an opportunity to, to proclaim God to the sailors, he gives kind of this, he, it, it is important information he delivers, but it's not the fullness of the story. He's not exactly God's best representative. And there's so many things that end up being not, again, you can, you can look at, there's connections between Jonah and Elijah, and you go, okay, Elijah was like this, Jonah was like that. Elijah did this, Jonah did that. There's all these back and forth. But there's so much of that that, that God not only makes fun of Jonah in this book in the context in which it was written, in, in pre-Christ Jewish Uh, observance, an understanding of who God was, worship of him. But it's like God plays the long game in terms of the humor itself. So think about this deep sleep. You've got got this this storm is going on. Everybody's afraid. They're They're praying. They're throwing stuff overboard. Jonah's down there asleep deep sleep. They have to wake him up. What are you doing? And Jesus, it's almost like he planned it on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. They get in a boat. 
They go out in the middle of the sea, and the storm comes, and everybody's freaking out. We're going to die. And Jesus is where? He's asleep in the boat. Do you think that he, he got a little bit of a grin on his face before he went to lay down for that nap? I have a feeling he knew exactly what was coming <laughs> and just how funny it would be to play the Jonah character. They wake him up. What are you doing? Why are you asleep? And he goes, what's the matter? Jesus in, it shows himself to be the true Jonah, what Jonah should have been. He's not concerned. And how, how, how does the situation resolve? He just commands, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves obey him. Jonah um, declares the bare minimum about who God is. Jonah refuses to obey the call in his life. I don't want to go to those people. I don't want to do that job. Jesus lays down his life for sinners. Those who were at war with him. Jesus' obedience, Jesus' command over every, all creation, Jesus' time in the grave, the three days and the three nights. He gives that as a sign to those asking for it. I'll give you the sign of Jonah, who was, who was in the depths for three days and three nights, and then came back out again. Jesus showed shows this incredible, it's, it's one of those things where you go, he didn't have to do that. Nobody would have expected that, that, that Jonah would be a, a sign of who the Messiah would be. I think there's, there's, there's humor to that. There's, there's really just kind of, I, I, keep, I kept coming up with different words, and I, Annie was like, why don't you just use a thesaurus, Dad? I was like, okay. Uh, none of the words seem to fit, but it's, it's like us. It's like Jesus parodies Jonah, in a sense, by bringing up over and over again these connections and showing how he did what should have been done, where Jonah failed. Where, where Jonah failed, Jesus succeeds. Over and over again. And isn't that wonderful? There's so much in this story that you go, it's funny just in its context, and then when you, when you add in the extra layer of how Jesus did it better, it's just even funnier. And not just did it better, but pointed out that he did it better. Remember how Jonah did that thing? Well, look at me, I'm doing it this way. And that's just, I think, that's a part of God's sense of humor that continues to echo. And whether it's the very specific things or the broader things, uh, some of it continues to still be funny today. And I just think that's fantastic. You're thousands of years later, and we can still look at this situation and go, wow, that's, that's really silly. That's absurd. That's ridiculous. What kind of a prophet would, would know this God that I serve made everything and think getting on a ship would get him away from God's rule. How, how can you escape? Um, the, we tend to look with piety, and there's probably something to it. I already said they respond appropriately, but the sailors, all the things the sailors do, on the one hand, is appropriate trying to trying to figure out how to resolve the situation on the other hand i mentioned there's this connection with elijah 
And, and it's very similar to the description of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. I know, we're in Carmel, but, but that mountain is Carmel. Uh, <laughs> the prophets of Baal, you know, they're, they're doing all the crazy things to get the attention of their God, and Elijah starts making fun of them. Yell louder, maybe he can't hear you, all the things, right? There's this sense in which what they're doing is both appropriate in the in the broad cultural context of polytheism and yet absurd in the context of israel knowing who god is and and knowing what it actually looks like to get his attention they don't have to do the absurd things they don't have to throw everything overboard they can just pray there's so much that's just absurd and and, and extreme. This word great, I'm not sure. I haven't done the, the work yet to figure out how consistent it is in the NIV that I'm working out of or other English translations, but it shows up a ton. Everything is huge in this story. The city, the storm, the whale, Everything, everything's a big deal. Everything's extreme in this story. And that's another piece of just that, it, yes, it's good storytelling, but it, like God's sense of humor in all of it is it's all the biggest thing, the most dramatic thing, the, the, the most extreme version of that thing. It's big fish story. It's big everything story. It's all big. It's all meant to really grab our attention in that way where we just go, really? Not that we doubt the truth. Again, that's not the focus, but rather that it helps us see that, that everything's backwards. Everything's upside down in this story. That, that Jonah really turns the world upside down, his world upside down, in his rejection of what God's called him to do. It all just gets flipped on its head. And God comes along and kind of plays with him flips it back over. It's fantastic. I'm sure that's not the best place to end a sermon. God's funny. Uh, but I think it's probably part of what we need to hear this morning. There's so much of our lives that we either, we, we make everything a big deal. Let's start there. Isn't everything the worst or the best? That when we find ourselves running from God, we know it. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we can be really hard on ourselves, like we're, we can be really hard on Jonah. So we make, make that the biggest deal. When we experience God's grace, we're so often either grateful that that's the biggest, greatest deal, or like Jonah, just so frustrated. Why do you keep showing grace? We're trying to get away from the grace. There's this sense that even in our own journeys, we also need to be able to step back and see that, that God has a sense of humor. And, and I've heard people say that about their own stories. I know that that's not a unique perspective, but it's one that's often lost when we're in this kind of a space on a Sunday morning studying God's word. God really does have a sense of humor. And the way that he works in and through all these things to both rule and reign and also shower grace is often really funny. 
when you can distance yourselves just a little bit from, from being in the midst of it. I'm sure Jonah was not laughing his head off at all these things. And yet, somebody wrote this stuff down. At some point, these details get put on paper. I wonder how that happened. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you for who you are, for this reminder that that the Lord of all creation, that we can't flee to, even in the depths of the grave, has both grace and humor. Lord, I pray that as we continue um, hopefully trying to follow you, I suppose there may be some here who are, who are like Jonah running from you. Lord, I pray that you would remind us wherever we are on our journey, that you would remind us of who you are, that we would be drawn to you as the, it seems the sailors were, that we would respond to your power and authority with reverence. That we would respond to your grace with gratefulness. And that we'd be able to laugh at ourselves along the way. Lord, I thank you for the ways that you show us who you are in each of our lives in such a variety of ways. I pray that you would make us faithful to relay those things to others, that we would proclaim not the bare minimum, but that we would proclaim the depth of your work in our lives, of your mercy, not only for us, but for others as well. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of reflection now, and uh, there will be a song that's played and sung, and you're welcome to try to join if you want, but this is really a time for you to reflect on the things that we've looked at in Jonah this morning, or maybe there's some other song that we sang, or the scripture we read together that's touching your heart. Maybe it's something completely outside of this service that you just need to spend time with God on. This is your time. Whatever posture you deem most appropriate, whatever it is you need to do, this is a time for you to spend with God. Mm -hmm.